Welcome, everybody, to the Gym Masters Show Live Entertainment Lifestyle Friday Talk Show Series. How's everybody doing today? It's so good to see your uh, smiley faces. And if you're not smiling, hey, we're going to perk things up. Got an extraordinary guest coming in from Los Angeles, California. For those of you who are Sherlock Holmes fans and also fans of Dracula and Frankenstein and lots more. Let me tell you, we've got an extraordinary guest joining us. Leslie S. Klinger, the world's foremost Sherlock Holmes, Dracula and Frankenstein expert and so much more is poised and positioned to share a lot of incredible stories with us. Also, he is a prolific author. He's a, an entertainment tax professional and attorney during the day. <laughs> and then he wears another hat later on. He is a real expert. Uh, don't you love that photo? Uh, he's a real expert when it comes to everything Sherlock Holmes and uh, again, Frankenstein, Dracula, and so much more. We're going to talk about that as he comes to us from Los Angeles, California. He is the author of several incredible books, as we just mentioned. And uh, one of the newest is a really, really cool one that we're going to talk about. You have it right there on the screen. Take a look at that. A strange case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. We're going to talk about this and so much more. But he's also penned. He's a prolific writer. Uh, so many incredible books. This one on Dracula, and take a look at this one too, Sandman. We're going to talk about some of these others. H.P. Lovecraft, he's an expert on Lovecraft as well. And of course, Sherlock Holmes here and The Anatomy of Innocence. These are just a few of the many. More Sherlock Holmes, of course. Uh, classic American crime fiction, 1920s, annotated. And also uh, Watchmen, annotated as well. We're going to talk about some of these as we go along. But again, uh, if you are aficionado and lover of Sherlock Holmes, guess what? You have found your source today. Or maybe it's Frankenstein. <laughs> Very apropos for the time of year it is right now with Halloween around the corner. Dracula, and so much more. Again, tell you a little bit about our very illustrious guest coming in from Los Angeles, originally by way of Chicago, Illinois, the suburbs of Chicago. Aless is considered to be one of the world's foremost authorities on Sherlock Holmes, Dracula, H.P. Lovecraft, Frankenstein, and the history of mystery and horror fiction. That's right. Les is a longtime member of the Baker Street Irregulars and served as the series editor for the manuscript series of the Baker Street Irregulars. He is currently the series editor for the BSI's biography series. He served three terms as chapter president of the Southern California chapter of the Mystery Writers of America and on its national board. He's also the treasurer of the Horror Writers Association and serves as co-editor of the Haunted Library, a series of horror classics published by the HWA. His lectures frequently include lectures on Sherlock Holmes, Dracula, Lovecraft, Frankenstein, and their worlds. And uh, he includes frequent panels at the Los Angeles Times Festival of Books and uh, lots of different cons, too. We'll talk about that. World horror conventions, world fantasy conventions, vampire cons, and Comic Palooza, Wonder Cons, San Diego Comic Cons. He's taught several courses on Sherlock Holmes and Dracula as well at the UCLA Extension. His work has received numerous awards and nominations, including the Edgar for Best Critical Biographical Book in 2005 for the new annotated Sherlock Holmes, The Complete Short Stories, and the Edgar for Best Critical Biographical Book in 2019 for Classic America. American crime fiction of the 1920s and the Anthony for best anthology in 2015 for in the company of Sherlock Holmes, which was incredible. He was nominated for an Edgar for best critical biographical book in 2006, two nominations for the Bram Stoker award for best nonfiction book. And is currently nominated for an Anthony for best critical nonfiction for classic American crime fiction of the 1920s. The new annotated Frankenstein was uh, recently nominated for a World Fantasy Award. And uh, his introductions and essays have appeared in numerous books, graphic novels, academic journals, newspapers, the Los Angeles Review of Books, Playboy Magazine as well. 
also uh, reviews books for the Los Angeles Times. He was a technical advisor for Warner Brothers on the film Sherlock Holmes, A Game of Shadows in 2011. And he also served in the role for Warner Brothers' earlier hit, Sherlock Holmes, in 2009. He has also consulted on a number of other novels, comic books, graphic novels featuring Sherlock Holmes and Dracula. Yes. And uh, he is in his office. And I said, and during the day, he's a tax attorney, works with a lot of entertainment professionals in our line of work. <laughs> That's why he has the big magnifying glass. Uh, he's actually taking a look at the paperwork to make sure all of the I's are cro- dotted and all of the T's are crossed on the paperwork. Won't you join me in welcoming him live and direct from his offices in Los Angeles, California, Les Klinger. Les, welcome to the Jim Masters Show live series. It is a pleasure to have you here today. Thanks, Jim. It's nice to be here. I tell you, uh, what a background, ton. Huh? I'm fascinated by the well, fact- Well, in a few minutes we have left after all that introduction. So. You, I tell you, yeah. you've done so much and that's what everybody says. Your mom faxed that to me this morning and she said, I want that described verbatim. So, you know, you listen to mom. Well, well, yeah. <laughs> I, I tell uh, you, I, it's I try an, to keep busy. Keep it simple, right? <laughs> Well, it gives people a good breath of uh, who you are and what you do. And, and it's something that's been in your blood for a long time. No pun intended with the Dracula. But going back to the suburbs of Chicago growing up, you know, where did this interest, this passion, this this thirst for mystery and horror, and specifically for the likes of well, Sherlock Holmes, come in for you early on? Interestingly, I, I didn't really pay much attention to Sherlock Holmes when I was that age. I was an avid reader of science fiction, um, and I, uh, I, I, was a, I read everything I could read. I had read hundreds of science fiction books and, of course, comic books uh, back in uh, elementary school and high school. And, uh, and then I was an English major in college, which helped because he sort of broadened things. But it wasn't until I got to law school that uh, I received a gift from my, uh, my first wife uh, of uh, the annotated Sherlock Holmes, a book by William Baring Gould that came out in 1968. And it blew my mind. I mean, it just sort of opened my eyes to this uh, world of amateur scholarship and intense fandom uh, for Sherlock Holmes. And I I was hooked for life. It's amazing. Uh, So when you got hooked, what was the first thing you did to sort of pursue it? Did you start just doing investigatory work? Did you start writing about Sherlock? No, the writing came much later. In the beginning, I wanted to own things. I mean, you know, either you're a collector by, by birth or you're not. It turned out I was. I, my mother, of course, given away all my comics, as we all have suffered through. But uh, I started going into bookstores and saying, do you have anything Sherlock Holmes? And I started collecting in a sort of very casual way uh, things relating to Sherlock Holmes. It wasn't until um, actually um, almost uh, 25 years later that I said to myself, you know, I have enough leisure time why don't I write the kind of thing that I've been reading, that I've been collecting and reading so assiduously for the last 25 years? And so I started. I just started writing um, articles for uh, what we call Sherlockian journals. Uh, And then that turned into this crackpot idea that I would re-annotate the stories, that Baron Gould had done it, I would do it now adding 30 more years of scholarship. So I started doing that. And uh, to my delight, it got a, uh, an approving audience and it turned into a bigger and bigger project. And uh, then in 2002, out of the blue, I got a call from a senior editor at a major New York publisher who said, you know that old Baron Gould book that you love so much, Les? Uh, They didn't know that part, but they said, we want to put out a new edition like that. And we hear that you should be the editor. It was like, Mm. me? Yeah, right. Uh, So, um, so I did it. And, uh, and I had so much fun doing that, that when that project was over, 
I didn't want to stop. I wanted to sort of keep going with more books, uh, more fields, and the rest is history. I, I mentioned in the uh, beginning that you balance the two worlds, you know, as a tax attorney during the day, doing that intensive work. And then, of course, being a writer, that and that is true and true and runs through your blood. How do you balance it all? How do you balance doing all of it at the same time? Or do you have it structured in a way where, okay, we do this and then we go back to doing that? How does it work for you, Les? Well, the first most important element is a loving family. Um, a family that understands that you're going to disappear for hours on end uh, into stacks of books and go do things. Um, maybe it makes for interesting dinner conversations. Maybe it makes me more pleasant to be around that I'm <laughs> absent for those. those <laughs> on. But I think one of the things that lawyers and journalists um, learn early on is to work with deadlines and to work with juggling lots of projects. I mean, as a lawyer, I don't have the luxury to spend the entire day working on one client's matter. I will work on 10 different clients' matters and I may do a little part of one and a little part of another and so on. So writing just became part of that juggling act pretty early on. So as you're going along and you're, you're developing this keen interest and understanding of Sherlock Holmes, what are some of the key things for you that stand out that maybe none of us are privy to or even aware of that would surprise us? Well, I, I think that um, what, what interests me about Sherlock Holmes and what interests me about, frankly, all of the books and, and the figures that I've written about is their um, stature, their universality. Why is it that so many people love the Sherlock Holmes stories? Why is it that so many people know, at least think they know, Dracula or Frankenstein's creature um, and, uh, and more recently Jekyll and Hyde? And so that's part of the interest, is trying to figure out what is it about those books that is so universal? In the case of Sherlock Holmes, I think it came out of the times. This was a time in England when science was revered, um, reason was uh, revered, and there was a sense that um, we could master the universe. You know, that uh, the British Empire was going to make everything just peachy for everybody. I mean, I didn't, I'm not saying this is right or that they were right. But that was, that was sort of the pervading mood. And Sherlock Holmes is in many ways the, the epitome of that. Um, it's reason, rationality, um, taking care of things, taking care of crime, taking care of bad things happening to people. But more importantly, Sherlock Holmes is not a law enforcement officer. He's not a cop. Um, he is a figure of justice. And so it also embodies that belief that there is such a thing as justice. And Holmes works for justice, not just to catch the criminal. Uh, I think in the end, all of us admire Sherlock Holmes and, and, and think, gee, it would be great if I could be like that. If I, and I, I think of it, I, I call Holmes a superhero with an attainable superpower. If we just work hard enough, you know, if we just study hard enough, we can be like Sherlock Holmes. Um, and I, I don't know if that's true. I've never achieved it, but it seems like something that we ought to be able to do. So that's that's one of the good reasons to read Sherlock Holmes. It, it gives us a goal. It gives us a, an idea that we can be like that, just and fair and reasonable. Are there... In addition to those three characteristics, are there other characteristics that uh, you that resonate with you that Sherlock Holmes has? Sure, he's a he's a bohemian. That is to say, he doesn't care about society. He doesn't care about outward signs of success. Um, he's self motivated. He's mm -hmm. driven by the his own passions. Um, he'll only take on a case if it interests him. Um, and wow, I mean, I wish I could live like that. Right. Uh, just sort of independent of the approval of others, 
um, and uh, independent of the economics of it and all that. So sure, all of those, there are little fantasies. I mean, I can't, I don't think I'm ever going to achieve that, but it seems like something, think it's worth fantasizing about because there are laudable goals. Absolutely right. Yes. What is it that uh, has intrigued you about the others, about Dracula, about Frankenstein? Does this go back to childhood at all? The, no, the, not really. I mean, other than, I mean, if somebody asked me the other day in an interview, uh, what, what really scares you less? And I said, the big bad wolf. I mean, that's, you know, that was one of my childhood fears. I, mean, I used to have nightmares about the big bad wolf. And of course, like a lot of people, I was scared of the dark. But no, I think my interest in Dracula... Mummies were pretty scary, too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> my interest in Dracula and Frankenstein's creature were really, again, like Sherlock Holmes, sort of more interested in why are we so interested in them? Mm. Uh, and mm. so when you read the books, I mean, Frankenstein is not a book about... Um, a mad scientist who creates a creature that goes wild and you know is afraid of fire and chased down by the villagers. That's not the book. That's a movie. Uh, the book is a very serious um, consideration of parenthood, of having a child, a motherless child. That's the creature, um, and a father who essentially abandons uh, his progeny. That's Victor Frankenstein. The villain of that book is not the creature. The villain is Victor, who abandons his own creation. Uh, Dracula. Dracula is very much about the fascination of, of life and death, the borders between life and death, uh, the fear that foreigners are invading us, you know, invading England, uh, taking our women. You know, that, that's very much a subtext of Dracula, as is probably, uh, uh, you'll excuse the expression, a sexual frenzy. There's there's a sort of a lot of coded sex in, in Dracula. Um, and uh, all that sucking and exchanging of fluids. Um, so it's looking at the books in a deeper way to understand why they've been so incredibly popular and perpetuated. I mean, these are old books, mm -hmm. Sherlock Holmes, you know, the first Sherlock Holmes story appeared um, 125 years ago, 135 years ago. Right. Um, Frankenstein is 1818. My goodness. That's more than 200 years ago it was written and first published. So there's something going on here that we're still fascinated by these stories. So it seems as you're saying, which I'm deducing here, as much as there's the fascination in the storylines, the characters, and, and all that swirls around, you're just as fascinated by the human reaction, the human condition, the under, trying to almost like understanding the psychology of it all. Why are people, why do they gravitate to that? Why are they yeah. uh, drawn in? What is it they're getting? Um, from that very interesting there's a series i think it's on netflix it's called you and it stars the actor penn badgley and he plays this really sadistic guy who you know uh is, is after this one girl and he's always trying to win her over and he's doing these horrific things i mean it can get really tough to watch in a way but he was interviewed and he talked about here he is, an actor. He's playing that role. He's played a lot of other, he's on Gossip Girl, all these other shows. But this particular role, people just love him in it and there's a thirst for it. And they, he's been asked multiple times, you know, why do you think that is? Why do you think people are drawn to seeing this character, Joe, being so awful and horrific and doing these sadistic, hor you know, horrible things, graphic things? Um, and he said, even he's perplexed as the actor in trying to figure it out. I mean, that he gets letters and he gets notifications and all kinds of material coming his way from people who pour out their heart about how they love him playing that horrific 
character right. and he he separates himself from it and he's fascinated by why are people so in the beginning he was almost as the actor bothered by the response that people had right. that they're actually in love with him and in love with the character it's an interesting thing when you really break it down, isn't it? Oh, so, so yes, I've spent a lot of time looking at what I think of as sort of the popular culture aspects of these stories. I mean, when you look at Sherlock Holmes is clearly the most filmed character of all time. I mean, there's something like 250 movies. Um, and that's not counting episodes of elementary or things like that. That's how many different film versions there are, how many different actors have portrayed him and so on. Um, and the same Dracula is way up there. Um, so is Jekyll and Hyde. I mean, hundreds of films, comic books, graphic novels, stage plays, et cetera. But you're talking, you're talking, Jim, about really even deeper questions. Uh, the deeper questions are, and, and we're talking about mysteries and horror. Why? Why do we want to read horror fiction? Um, I have my own theory about that. It, it's maybe a crackpot theory, but it's my theory is that it's an experiment. It's about practice. Uh, we want to be scared, but we want to be scared in a way that we're in control. We're in control. We can always close the book, uh, uh, go put it away, read it again the next night, turn on the light, you know, et cetera. So it's a way to experience really scary things and and the the thrilling emotions that come with it but we're in control mysteries are different mysteries i think in many ways are a reassurance to us that in the end things will come out well uh, because that's what it is i mean that's what happens in a mystery there's there's order imposed on a chaos um, and uh, a detective or a police officer in the end if it's a good mystery solves the case and mm -hmm. says to us, okay, you know, we've fixed things now. And we'd like to believe that that's the way it's really going to happen. It's interesting. I, I finally came to the deduction that I prefer psychological thrillers versus graphic graphic horror like sure. i would rather see you know an alfred hitchcock type thing twilight zone gee twisted ending wow this can really happen gee look at how all the neighbors turned against each other thinking that the neighbors across the street were the martians One just of sort of these episodes. these these fabulous uh observations of everyday life and how we can We've even seen some of that in the pandemic, how people have acted towards each other. That some of it's been like episodes of the Twilight Zone. Uh, yeah. A preference for that, figuring it out. Are, is somebody behind the door? Are they under the bed? You know, some of that versus uh, like the Saw movies where it was just, you know, right. hacking and, and right. Right. Well, that doesn't, well, that, yeah. for me, I don't go towards that. It just doesn't. Uh, H.P. Lovecraft is a great. Uh, exponent of that and yes uh, notwithstanding uh the images that people associate with lovecraft of tentacles and monsters and all that that's really not in the books um i mean there are vague ambiguous descriptions and lovecraft I mean, he wrote a story he even called the unnameable uh he was the master of off-camera bad things happening Mm -hmm. uh, and you don't need to describe them. There's no, as some wise person said a long time ago, you know, the best special effects are the ones that go on right up here. Right, uh, right. So it, it's better to let the reader sort of fill in those gaps with their own scary things. And, and uh, so Lovecraft had this theory that in order to really sell a scary story, it has to be, 99% realistic. Um, there has to be a verisimilitude, great word. Uh, and then you can have that 1% thread of the supernatural, the scary, et cetera, because then it really scares us. It's in the context of something believable. You probably don't have an answer to this, and it's probably a Hollywood thing, but <laughs> why is it that almost in every movie, of then and of now, 
whenever somebody is being chased after by the villain, the bad person, the monster, they're being chased and they're in that running scene, they always trip and fall. <laughs> and, and of course, their cell phone battery has died. <laughs> That's a modern problem. And That's the older ones, they didn't have to worry about that. Yeah. But, uh, right. They uh, trip and fall and their their uh, high heel oh. gets caught in uh, shrubbery or something. Sure. Well, because that's what we're afraid of is that, you know, oh, we're almost safe, you know. Uh, and uh, uh, then, then something happens unexpected that makes us gasp and say, uh-oh, we thought yeah. we were out of the danger. But now there's just a little more. Yeah. Do you have dreams and do you have any recurring dreams? Well, I've gotten over the big bad wolf. So uh, that doesn't, re I don't have those dreams anymore, but sure. Uh, and, you know, that's why I say that when I think about my dreams, I, I understand that they are uh, tests. They are experiments. They're trying out how I will deal with something. I mean, I'm, I'm at the stage of life where, you know, the horrible things tend to be normal tragedies as opposed to supernatural things. Uh, right. But even so, we dream about these things because we want to sort of build up our muscles to be able to deal with those things that are going to happen, whether it's right. our parents dying yeah. or, and my parents have both been gone for a long time, um, you know, or other, or we lose our job or whatever it is that, that is a, a serious fear. Um, we're going to dream about those things and yeah. practice, practice. Yeah. At least that's my crackpot idea. So no, it's, yeah. I, I tend to get sometimes where I'm, uh, where I feel like I'm falling off a cliff. Like I feel, and then it wakes me up and jolts me. Just this feeling like I'm at the edge of a cliff and somehow a, a slight wind or something comes and just knocks me off. And just at the point where I'm going off is when I twitch and then wake up the feeling of uh, something dropping, I'm dropping below to who knows what is even there. If maybe it's a black hole that goes on forever. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm a good dreamer now in the sense that I, I, and I, it's not a skill that I deliberately learned. It's just one I seem to have developed of being able to say in the dream to myself, get over this. This is silly. You know, yeah. it's one of those where, okay, I can't find my car, you know, the car is lost. It's somewhere in the parking lot. I have no idea. And I'll say to myself in the dream, come on, change it. You found the car. You know, this is boring. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. It's, it's Some of those Twilight Zones were like that, too, where it was a repetitive. Remember the woman that had the dream? Um, it was uh, room for one more. And it was oh, being yes. taken to the morgue and then it tied into room for one more on the airplane. And then the airplane eventually blows up and room for one more, honey. And it was a recurring well, it, nightmare she would have. Based on a story by Robert W. Chambers, uh, a, a, an amazing story. Uh, and uh, yeah, I mean, there's some great horror stories like that. Uh, yeah. I think it's Chambers um, yeah. that, that has a story about a... Uh, hearse it's like room for one more yeah exactly um tell us about this book here um what is it about dr jekyll and mr hyde and i, I imagine people probably ask you all the time um was there really a dr jekyll and mr hyde did they really exist well so what fascinates me about this book is the same kind of things that are interesting to me about Holmes and Frankenstein and Dracula, namely that there that the book got distorted in by the public um, adaptations of it. Uh, the book was very successful when it came out in 1886, um, and it was immediately adapted for the stage, not by Stevenson, by by other people, uh, and as happened with those others that I've mentioned, was immediately distorted into being a story about a good person um, who probably went down a scientific path that he shouldn't have uh, and found some things out and ended up loosing a monster, Mr. Hyde, uh, and in the end, suffering from that. Well, that's not the story at all. Uh, the real story is you have a person, Dr. Jekyll, who is 
in a way, based on Stevenson, I'll come back to that. Um, but Dr. Jekyll, who is a troubled person, he's done bad things when he was young. We don't know what they were. We don't know if they were sexual escapades or was he engaging in homosexual adventures at a time when uh, that was frowned on in Victorian England, frowned on, it was illegal, uh, uh, whatever. But he's trying to make up for it. And he has this wrongheaded idea that if he can separate out into a separate being almost the bad parts of himself, that he'll be able to be a better person. Um, and I think Stevenson's idea um, was that was fundamentally a, the wrong approach. The, the right approach was it's, it's what Stevenson called that old war of the members, meaning I think we all have Mr. Hyde's inside us. We all have bad impulses, bad habits, bad ideas. And what we need to do is we need to learn to integrate our personality, to deal with the reality of those impulses and to, and to govern them, not wall them off, but to recognize them and, uh, and, and mature, maturely deal with them. Um, Stevenson himself felt that he was a hypocrite. Uh, he had been, uh, his parents had wanted him to be an architect, uh, and he wanted to be an artist. He wanted to, to write. He wrote poetry. He wrote historical novels. Um, of course, he wrote children's novels, such as Treasure Island or uh, 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 The Child's Garden of Verses. Or, Black uh, Arrow. You know, and yeah, the Black Arrow, so That's more adult. The Black adult, Arrow, The Master yeah. of Gallantry. Those are those are all kind of books. Um, but he finally chucked it. He was living in in England, a uh, respectable life, and finally said, you know, I got to be true to myself here. And he picked up and he moved to D and um, with his family. Some so, people said that he, he wrote, now again, could be just myth, but you hear these things bantied about, that he wrote Jekyll and Hyde while on a cocaine binge or something yeah, like that. Yeah, is that, is that a great myth? It's uh, so... Stevenson had respiratory issues for most of his life. I mean, he, he was not a well person. And like many Victorians, therefore, he dosed himself with lots of cocaine and uh, opium-based drugs because that was what you could get at the pharmacy. That's what you they know? had for that, you and know. Re and remember, this is a time when mothers are being told, you know, hey, your baby's bothering you with the colic? Just give him some laudanum, you know, that's that's opium diluted in water. And uh, so the attitudes about those kinds of drugs was very different. So he was not a cocaine addict. He was not uh, in any way habituated to drugs. He just was taking them for medical reasons. But the, the book was, he said, um, he didn't say it was inspired by a dream. He said he had a dream that inspired him to write a particular scene. He dreamt the scene that's called the window scene in the book where Dr. Jekyll is uh, talking to some friends out the window and then suddenly sort of yanked back from the window. Um, I won't give anything more away about that, but um, so he very vividly dreamt that scene and woke up and in a fever pitch wrote the story. I mean, he wrote it, it's not that long, um, and he wrote it in three days. Mm. Uh, now, at that point, the story goes, the manuscript was burnt. Now, That's what I heard, yeah. Who burned it? We're not sure. Did Stevenson himself burn it? Uh, did his wife burn it? I inclined to that theory. She claimed to have burned it. That's um, his wife, Fanny. Why. Yeah. But I think it was because the first draft was too sexual. Um, the... As I said, the resulting story is very ambiguous about what did Jekyll do that was bad, uh, and frankly, what did Hyde do that was bad, um, other than murdering Sir Danvers Carew. But um, so I think Florence wanted him to get rid of that explicit stuff and make it more allegorical. In any event, he did rewrite it from scratch. He, he sort of threw away the first draft, started all over again. And it was only six weeks between the time he wrote it and the time it was ready to be published. So it mm. was it was a very rapid uh, product. But 
I reject this, you know, I dreamed the story, my unconscious wrote it stuff, because it's so meticulously crafted. Once you know the secret, and we all do know the secret, because we've all seen films or cartoons or whatever, the secret that Jekyll and Hyde are one person. That's the big secret. Uh, once we know that secret, you go back and you read the book, and you see how carefully Stevenson laid out the clues um, that Jekyll, uh, th th this explains so much of the bizarre action that happens in the story. It's really incredible when you sort of break it out that way and you look at it from that sort of angle. Also, um, obviously, Jekyll and Hyde has been adapted for the stage and screen on multiple occasions. Why do you think so many times, Les? Because it's a universal story. Because we, we, we recognize that we do have those parts of ourselves. And, and I think we want to see how he deals with it. Now, the screen and stage versions largely distorted it. They made him a better person. Um, they made him a more heroic person. There's usually a love interest. There are no women in the book uh, to speak of. There's one maid who's in the background. Uh, so they give him a love interest. Uh, they make him a hero who is victimized by a, sort of an accident of science and all that. But uh, nonetheless, they're, they're still all dealing with this inherent duality or, or different aspects of our personalities that we all have to deal with. And I think that universality is why it's been retold so many times. It's really incredible. Um, there's been a lot of movie versions too. Do you have a uh, favorite movie version from your opinion? I do, and it's only because of sort of the the brilliance of it, and that's the 1920 John Barrymore version. Uh, it's a silent film. You can find it on YouTube. Um, and what's incredible is to watch Barrymore uh, transform from Jekyll into Hyde without any special effects, just sort of right there on the screen. And it's astounding. Uh, and uh, all of, I mean, that film is no better than any of the others in terms of uh, sticking to the original story. Um, but that that's my favorite of the bunch. But as you said, there are dozens. I mean, there's, there's comic ones, there's sexy ones, um, Dr. Jekyll and Sister Hyde, uh, the adult Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Uh, there are comic ones. There's a very early silent comic film with uh, Stan Laurel. Mm, uh, right. And uh, uh, so there's something for every taste in, in Jekyll and Hyde out there. Nobody's done what I would think of as being the definitive version yet. But we're waiting. Kenneth Ronagle will undoubtedly get to it one of these days. So. Still waiting for Dr. Jekyll and Rawhide. There you go. <laughs> or an Augahide. An Auga. You know, the 19th century, obviously, incredibly fascinated with monsters and Frankenstein's creature yeah. and Hyde and, and Dracula. What do you think it is about that period, the 19th century, that, where this fascination is so prevalent? Well, prevalent. I think part of it is the growth of science. It's yeah. simply... Um, sort of more and more things are coming to light and being, we'll say, rationally explained. Maybe, maybe they're not quite rationally explained. And so we have that, that um, investigative aspect to it. In, in, uh, in Dracula, for example, we have Van Helsing going on about how science has been looking into these uh, things that have been just subjects of folklore in the past. Uh, certainly, Frankenstein is very much focused on um, the budding science studying what life is. But I think it's bigger than that. I think monstrosity fascinated the Victorian age because monsters are almost by definition outsiders. They're, they're not part of society. And so looking at monsters gives us a chance to look carefully at society. For a writer, it's a way to criticize things about society without really sort of going head on um, by showing how the outsider clashes um, with society. 
So that's the case in Dracula. It's certainly the case of Frankenstein's creature, um, who is an outsider, but but not a bad person inherently. Uh, so I, I think there is that fascination with that figure of the other, uh, because it's such a repressed, restricted society, the 19th century almost generally. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I, another thought that I had is, um, would you would you say that Jekyll and Hyde, like Frankenstein, is a, a warning about the limits of science and things maybe we shouldn't investigate? Well, I think that's that is the popular view that that's what those books are about. They're not, but that but that is what the films have, have explored. Um, and Lovecraft, by the way, is also interested in that theme. I mean, Lovecraft is is there writing in the 1920s and the early 1930s. Uh, at a time when um, physics is going wild, you know, we're discovering uh, the galaxy outside of, of our own little uh, universe. Uh, where they still discovered they discovered Pluto during Lovecraft's uh, youth, and so and now they took it away from being a planet yeah, for well, Pluto. <laughs> uh, okay, so it's a TNO now. So, uh, but Lovecraft was very interested in the science, and yes. He very much thought that we should be scared by the amount we were learning, that we were going to learn things that maybe we were better off not knowing, not because they were dangerous, but because they would make us realize how insignificant uh, humans are in the cosmos. I don't know that that's, uh, I mean, I don't agree with him. Um, and he was a strange duck, racist. Um, a bit of a recluse, um, but um, he did, he, he was responding to the science. And I think what it showed us was the opposite. Isn't it incredible that we live in this immense galaxy and that we're this little tiny speck of dust in a corner of it? Uh, what the astronauts call the overview effect, uh, giving you a real uh, feeling for the, the, sanctity of life and how precious it is uh, and how remarkable it is. Must be why I love the ocean as much as I do, because it's far larger, greater, and more powerful than I am. Yet it breeds recreation and enjoyment and life and the sun rises out of it and sets in it. And it just is something that I literally here along the coast, I'm always in it, swimming, surfing, boogie boarding, right. sailing it. It calls to me because there's a certain mutual respect that it has for me and I have for it. I know not to push its limits and it'll provide great joy, but also it is far greater than I will ever be. And there's something very uh, grounding about that, that there are things that are grander than yourself, greater than, and that we are just little salts in a larger picture. And sometimes I think we need to remind ourselves of that because there's, there's plenty of people going around thinking that the world is just created for them and right. resolving. Usually they're driving on the highways, but uh, right. so it's pretty, <laughs> hey, buddy, this road isn't just for you. <laughs> it's pretty exalting to go out. And if you live in a place where you can see the sky to lie on your back on the ground at night and look up at that starry mm, sky and yes. see how insignificant we are. It's very refreshing. Now, was there a scientific basis less for Jekyll turning into Hyde? Well, there was not not quite, but there was um, exploration of that. There was certainly a good deal of science going on. This is before Freud. Yeah. So they don't really, nobody's talking about the id and the ego and those kinds of things. But nonetheless, there were... Um, psychologists paying attention to multiple personalities, what we would think of as split personalities, uh, and of course the effects of chemicals. I mean, the effects of drugs on uh, people it was beginning to be understood. As we said earlier, you know, cocaine was available at the pharmacy, so nobody really understood the all of the aspects of drugs, but they were beginning to explore what those things could do, and so there was a scientific interest in the subject. There wasn't any real specific basis for it. Just like with Frankenstein, there was a good deal of experimentation about where what's life? What is life? What's the difference between a dead thing and a living thing? Uh, 
You know, we still have trouble explaining that. Uh, we still can't. What, why is this cat dead and this cat alive? What's missing from one versus the other? I mean, we can say a soul, but it's probably a little more than that. Maybe, maybe so, maybe there's more, we don't know. So we still don't have answers to these questions, but the interest was brewing in the 19th century, yes. I want to take a look at some of the other works as well. Tell us about this one, Les. So Sandman came about, Neil Gaiman and I have been friends for maybe 15 or 20 years. And um, we had a lot of debates over the years about what I should work on next. And I had joked with him once or twice about, well, what about Sandman? Because it's for those who, who don't know it, it's 78 issues of the comics. This says through 75, there's actually three bonus issues. Um, and they are so literate, so intricately detailed um, uh, with historical background, pop culture references and so on, that to me, they cried out for annotation. And we always joked and Neil would say, well, let's wait till I'm dead. And then one day he called me up and said, you know what? I'm actually starting to forget why I wrote some of the things I did. We should do this now. And so he said, I'm calling DC. And he did. And they said, OK. So it was a joyful project. It was the first time I had done an annotated book with a living author and therefore a very different experience. I actually got to write my notes and then show them to the author and say, what do you think? And he, you know, Neil spent a lot of time on the notes going over them and saying, you got this right, you got this part wrong, you should add a note about this, uh, and so on. And by the way, we did it again with his American Gods. Uh, you didn't show the cover of that, but in 2020, uh, we published uh, Annotated American Gods, his great novel, mm. same thing, very rich. But this was unique. Nobody had ever done an annotated comic book before. Um, and I don't know that there's very many that can mm, withstand annotation is probably the right description. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but Watchmen, which you did show the cover from, um, is one of the small number of others that could bear that kind of sort of careful study of the story, of the text, uh, of the details. Um, it, it's a very, very rich story um, set in the Vietnam War era. And by the way, that was kind of odd for me because I realized when I was writing the notes that I actually needed to have notes explaining what was the Vietnam War? Who was Richard Nixon and Gerald Ford and Henry Kissinger? And, you know, that readers were not going to be people necessarily my age who lived through those times. That's interesting. Yes, you got to think about that uh, as part of the equation as you're writing. Uh, I like the way you you bring that in. Uh, Dracula, of course, we touched upon a little bit. Maybe you can expand on this one. So Dracula was my wife's idea, I have to say, uh, and uh, my wife, Sharon. And when I finished Sherlock Holmes and I was sort of saying, wow, that was really fun. What can I do next? She said, how about Dracula? You, I know you love that book. And as I thought about it, I realized it was perfect because Dracula is almost exactly contemporary with Sherlock Holmes. Yeah. Uh, he, he clearly walked the streets of London at the same time as Holmes. Um, and so I already had a lot of the Victorian research material. So I loved diving. I read the book in college and I loved sort of diving back into it and, and looking very carefully at, at the text. I was also very lucky. Um, I had written to, I knew that there was um, a manuscript that existed. Um, it had been sold at an auction and I wrote to the auction house and said, could you put me in touch with the person who bought it? It turned out that it was uh, Paul Allen, the Microsoft billionaire who had bought the manuscript and he allowed me to come spend two days uh, going through it page by page and looking at what changed, uh, what was added, what was subtracted, and so on. And so I put all that into footnotes in there uniquely. I was the first scholar to really 
uh, study the manuscript of the text. That's really incredible, you know, and uh, I encourage folks to make sure they pick up copies of these books because uh, they're fascinating and they do draw you in. There's another one here I wanted to show. Lovecraft. Oh, so, so we said a little bit about Lovecraft. He's this, he's this strange racist dude who wrote horror stories in the 1920s and 1930s. But I was interested in Lovecraft because he had, like we've talked about in other contexts, an enormous influence. If you, if you talk to um, a major horror writer post Lovecraft, Stephen King, Clive Barker, Neil Gaiman, Peter Straub, uh, Robert Block, they would all tell you how much Lovecraft influenced them. I just finished reading Stephen King's new uh, fairy tale, and he dedicates it to Lovecraft. I mean, it's mm -hmm. clearly based on a lot of Lovecraft. And in fact, the character talks about uh, reading Lovecraft. Um, so I wanted to see what was it there that was so influential, so important to these writers. Uh, and it was this thing that I talked about before, this art of a realistic situation with an element of horror in it that made it work and selling it that way. Uh, and so Lovecraft, who lived in New England and loved New England, uh, wrote the wrote dozens, I mean, of stories. I, there's two volumes. Um, uh, one cleverly called the New Annotated Lovecraft, and the other one is called the New Annotated Lovecraft Beyond Arkham. Uh, so I think their total is 47 stories between the two volumes. He wrote more than that, but the ones we left out were really sort of the chaff. They're, they're not very good stories. Um, and I, I looked at, again, the cultural background, the historical backgrounds. He was a great student of science, uh, very much interested in, in geology and anthropology. He was also very interested in astronomy. Um, and so there's a lot of good science in there. He was also, unfortunately, he would use a $10 word when a nickel word would do. Mm -hmm. So uh, there's a lot of explaining of what those $10 words mean. But uh, it was a lot of fun to do. And again, there's a very strong Lovecraft community um, like Sherlock Holmes, that uh, gathers uh, every couple of years. Uh, I was just there this summer. It's called Necronomicon, uh, and uh, it's in Providence, Rhode Island, and it's a great bunch of people who are fascinated by the weird. It's amazing. You go to a lot of those conventions and cons and all, huh? You've been through I, the years. I You've do gone over the years. I, there's there are. A couple of big ones. I mean, I live in Southern California, so San Diego Comic Con is a treat. Uh, I always describe it as 150,000 of your best friends. Um, you know, it's it's an experience. Uh, yeah. But it's amazing how many writers actually go to Comic Con, and so I usually it's it's about seeing friends and and geeking out a bit. It's a big but, one in New Jersey, isn't there? A thriller one. There's there's a bunch of them. They're all over the country. Uh, there's a big New York Comic Con, um, but San Diego is still the biggest. New York is coming up fast, but but San Diego is still the biggest. Uh, and the big mystery convention is called BoucherCon. Um, it's held in. The, it rotates around sort of where it is. It's usually in the fall, and um, it is uh, a usually like 500 mystery writers and a thousand readers. Um, so I love going there again to see lots of friends. And um, then there are other ones. There's a horror, the, the world, there's the World Fantasy Association. There is uh, Stoker Con, which is put on by the Horror Writers Association. Uh, and then some local things, but I'm a social person. Um, I enjoy going to the cons to see friends and and it, you know, listening to them talk about books, we have, there's always a lot of panels where writers uh, uh, talk about the books. And I love the LA Times Festival books. That's a whole other thing. Uh, that's by invitation. So I've been very honored to be on panels over the last 10, 12 years. Got another one here. Anime. So this is a totally different book for me. Yeah. Uh, this is, I, I, I really hope people will go out and read this book. This book was, 
The idea for the book was by my friend, Laura Caldwell, who's now deceased. Uh, Laura was the creator of a project called Life After Innocence, which was about helping people who had been wrongfully convicted and subsequently exonerated. So they're, they're eventually, after a long period of time, found to be innocent and released from prison, helping them re-enter society. So what we wanted to do in this book was to share the experiences of exonerees with readers. So we put together 15 different exonerees with 15 different major mystery writers. You can see their names on the cover. I mean, Lee Child, Sarah Paretsky, uh, and so on. And each of them did a chapter that was focused on one step of the typical story. So the first chapter, for example, by S.J. Roseanne is about the arrest. The second, and the, sort of the shock of me? You're arresting me? Uh, and, and the second chapter is about the interrogation. And the third chapter is about the arraignment. And the fourth chapter is about the trial and so on. And so each of the authors, and this was essentially a volunteer thing by the authors, uh, and the profits from the book are going to the Innocence Project. Um, but uh, it is so heart-wrenching to read the stories of these exonerees. I mean, there are people talk in the book, there are characters, there are individuals who uh, were in prison for 25, 30 years for crimes they didn't commit. Mm -hmm. um, and ultimately, the system finally let them go. But it's not an indictment of the criminal justice system. It's a book that wants everybody to understand that maybe as much as five to 10% of the people in prison are not guilty of the crimes they were convicted of. Uh, now, That's pretty scary, huh? Well, it is scary. And sometimes it's because the cops have said, well, they were guilty of something. You know, so we'll stick them with this conviction here because they deserve to be in jail. We have, I don't know if you know that America can be really proud. We have the highest rate of incarceration of any country in the world. We have more people total. We have a higher percentage of our population. Um, and one third of the women in the world who are incarcerated are American prisoners. So this has been our solution, unfortunately, to poverty. Mm -hmm. um, and to problems of the of the ghettos and the low income communities is put them in jail, and it's not working, and mm -hmm. it's not a good system. And so we we explored that in this book, and it's uh, it's heartbreaking to read the book. Yeah, fascinating. Here's another totally different idea. Lori King, my dear friend Lori King, and I um, had this crazy idea that if we went to major A-list writers, and you can see the list on that cover of some of the ones that contributed. And we said to them, what if you wrote a story that you were inspired to write by Sherlock Holmes? We're not asking you to write a Sherlock Holmes story. We're asking you to write a story that sort of starts with Sherlock Holmes in some way. So for example, Michael Conley wrote a lovely story for us about, it's a Harry Bosch story, uh, and the and the medical examiner's name is Art Doyle. And there's some Sherlockian behavior in the story. Sarah Paretsky wrote a lovely story about um, uh, a, a character uh, invented by Anna Catherine Green, Amelia, Amelia Peabody, who is a sort of a Miss Marple type. Oh, yeah. Amelia existed in the, fir the first appearance of Amelia Peabody was 1898. And Sarah imagined what if she had crossed paths with Holmes uh, and so on. So we've done five of those anthologies. They are so much fun. Every one of the writers has said to us, oh, goody, I can't wait to write this story. I'm so excited to be able to play in your little sandbox. Here, so. <laughs> I like that. Oh, goody. <laughs> So really, I mean, you know, nobody's doing these writers. I mean, Lee Child is not doing this for the money that we've paid him to write the story because it isn't very much. He could have been writing another Reacher novel, but instead he wrote a short story for us. Brilliant story uh, called The Boneheaded League, uh, a takeoff on the Redheaded League and uh, a wonderful story. So 
Yeah. You'll enjoy reading them. Some of them make them you laugh. Some of them are great mysteries. And then the, this one, oh, my love, this book. Mm -hmm. uh, I was so sorry that, um, I mean, it won the Edgar, so I'm very mm -hmm. happy about that. Um, but I had hoped to turn this into a series, but we'll get to the series in a minute. So this is the five greatest mystery novels, I think, of the 1920s. It's the first Charlie Chan mystery, the first Philo Vance, uh, the first of Dashiell Hammett's novels, the first Ellery Queen novel, and the novel called Little Caesar, which became the great uh, uh, Edward G. Robinson film, um, annotate. This is really the birth of American crime fiction, or the the, the rebirth in, in a way. Anna Catherine Green was the first great American crime writer, but she sort of fell out of fashion in the 1910s. And Brit England was dominating the bestseller lists of, of mystery writing until these folks came along. Mm. So mm. the good part is that this led to not a series of big books like that, but a series that you didn't mention, Jim, in your introduction called the Library of Congress Crime Classics. So this is the brainchild of Barbara Peters, who is the uh, proprietor of the Poison Pen Bookstore in Scottsdale. Um, she had been distributing the British Library Crime Classics, and she said, by gum, there should be an American series. And so we went back to the Library of Congress and pitched them on the idea of publishing a series of American classic crime fiction. Um, and they said, yeah, it sounds great. We love it. So we're now up to, I think there are 13 titles that have come out. There's two more that are in the pipeline already. The series uh, has no, no signs it's ever going to end. Um, these range from The Dead Letter by Seeley Register, which is the very first American mystery novel. Um, that's 1866, all the way up to 1961, Del Shannon's Case Pending, um, and lots of decades in between. Um, I'm the series editor. I get to pretty much pick the title. And then I write, they're not heavily annotated and they're not illustrated because these are trade paperbacks. They're aimed for, we hope, sort of a mass readership and schools. I'm hoping that they will be used mm -hmm. in schools. But they're wonderful, amazing titles. The, the one that's just coming out is called Room to Swing by Ed Lacey. It won the Edgar for Best Novel in 1957. Um, and just got a starred review from Publishers Weekly. Uh, they thought, yes, it is. It's a great book. Um, they, my, it would have been nice if they said my edition of it was great, but they they recognized it was a great book. Uh, and so it's been a lot of fun sort of bringing these titles and these authors back into the spotlight that they deserve. Tell us about this uh, room that you're in. You're surrounded, uh, here you are at your office, but surrounded yeah. by a lot of cool things there. Well, my office is filled with Sherlockian memorabilia. And while you can't see it over on this wall is a bookcase filled with my own books. But um, early on, I mean, as you mentioned, I've been fortunate enough to be the technical advisor for uh, both the Warner Brothers, uh, Robert Downey films, and more recently, the two Enola Holmes films, the second of which um, comes out on Netflix November 4th, I think. Um, and so I love doing that, and I love movies. So my walls are filled with movie posters, Sherlock Holmes movie posters, and it's always a little test. The clients come in, and some people come in my office, and they say, oh, you like movies. And they look a little more closely, and they say, oh, you like mysteries. And then finally they say, oh, wait a minute. They're all Sherlock Holmes. So uh, it's, it's a test. It's a test, Joe. It's really cool. I think it's fantastic. Do you sometimes feel like a little kid in a candy oh, store? Yes. My wife had this conversation with me yesterday because what you don't see here, what I have at home, are little, I mean, I have finger puppets, I have action figures, I have uh, Funko Pop uh, dolls for Sherlock Holmes, vampires, uh, oh. the Watchmen villains and, and heroes. Uh, Jekyll and Hyde, etc., and they're you know Dracula, vampires everywhere, 
They're all over the house. She's at least made some zones. None of that in this room. None of that in this room. But well, uh, the house you know who would have loved to see all of that is Mr. Ah, George Burns. There you go. Mr. George Burns right here with a cigar in his red pocket square. He yeah. appears on our show all the time uh, to say hello and to pop in. And uh, he would have loved to have seen the puppets and all the rest. <laughs> they are great. Um, I have some of them over here. I have a bobblehead of Lovecraft. Do you? Uh, I have some little lead figurines of Sherlock Holmes and Mrs. Hudson and so on. But this is just a tiny part of the of the toys. Well, mm. Let's call them toys. That's what yeah, they well, are. Yeah. I mean, my aunt collected dolls and uh, some really serious ones. He's supposed to be – he's – supposed to be wrapped and not even really touched but he got passed down to me so he usually pops in and uh, he thoroughly enjoyed this conversation said you knocked it out of the park and of course you got god on your side because he played god in the movies of course there you go. movies and uh he's looking pretty good i tell you for his age huh hanging in there yeah hanging in there <laughs> he usually hangs down here with a cigar and he's got a big huge humongous martini down below good. that accompanies him <laughs> well you deserve one yeah, sip, sip, uh, I tell you. Uh, why do you love this? I mean, you're so busy with what you do during the day. What is it about? Is it also, is it cathartic? Is it therapeutic? Um, all of the above. It's all, all of the above, above Jim. It's, it's uh, yes. I mean, I, I love, I, I'm one of these people who loves learning new things. And I always discover things I had no idea about until I started researching and, and reading and studying the text, studying the social eras, et cetera. Um, I, here's a quick story that'll, that'll give an example of that. Um, in, in looking at the manuscript of Dracula, there's a scene where Dracula has jumped off of the ship on which he sailed to England in the form of a big black dog. And he's run off through the town and uh, there are reports in the newspaper that uh, the dog has torn the throat out of another dog or that another dog has been found murdered. Mm. Uh, and the account says police are examining the eyeballs of the dog to determine the identity of the killer. Wow. And I said, what? Yeah, what? Well, this was a cockamamie pseudoscience of the 19th century was called optography. It was a, the idea of a scientist who said the retina functions like a pinhole camera. And at the moment of death, it will record the last image it sees. And mm. so he tested this. He killed a lot of bunny rabbits trying to see if he could prove that. But ultimately, it failed. But this was taken very seriously. And I, it was just a revelation that this science had even existed. It's a perfect example of the sort of the eureka moments that happen sometimes in, in doing the research. And that's what makes it really fun. But I, I love doing it. I love producing these books. I'm astounded to discover that there are actually people out there who say, oh, it's another Klinger book. You know, it's like, really? Uh, I've achieved that kind of uh, audience where people want more of these kinds of same books that I want. Mm -hmm. I love reading these annotated books. And so I love creating them. Talking about the recent and congratulations, and then going back in time, looking at some of the previous works, what's also on the horizon on the forefront? Because I know this recent one was just released yes, a couple of days yes, ago. Yeah. Yeah. Congratulations oh, on that. Thank you. Uh, um, are you writing already the next one? I mean, is there... Well, <laughs> It's not quite that simple. Uh, it's a matter of uh, making sure the publisher is eager to do it. That's that's the way it is in the nonfiction world. You don't write the book first and then try and find a publisher. You find the publisher first who says do it. I mean, I've pitched a number of titles over the years that I've been turned down on. Um, but uh, fortunately, I've got I've always got a Library of Congress crime classics project going on. We're working right now on uh, the Canary murder case which mm. is by uh, S.S. Van Dyne, uh, who created Philo Vance, the great detective of the 1920s and 30s. Uh, and we're talking about the next big title. Uh, we've kicked around some ideas. I don't, it's premature to announce what it'll be, but 
there'll be another one, I'm sure, just because I get twitchy. You know, I got to do something. Yeah, yeah. This is, uh, well, it's legacy building as well. And there's so many people that are, you know, sinking their teeth into it. Again, no pun intended, but they're really, they, uh, right, exactly. And you've hit a chord with people, which I think is fantastic and, and really uh, breaking down and celebrating some of these iconic figures in our lives and so many others as you are as well. This is such a perfect, uh, I, I said that you were examining, you know, somebody's um, tax paperwork. Right. <laughs> well, there's, the- a, there's a famous <laughs> scene in, in, in one of the very, my favorite Sherlock Holmes story is called The Blue Carbuncle, mm-hmm. uh, which is a Christmas story. And yes. in that story, Holmes himself is investigating a battered old hat um to for clues and uh i don't need to go into it in depth but the picture was actually taken in istanbul because they invited me to uh, speak at a convention of turkish mystery writers there were three english-speaking writers and a whole bunch of turkish writers and it was amazing fun but they took that picture as part of a whole series of press photos so it's fantastic it's so apropos it's so perfect Uh, it looks kind of serious to me. It's, uh, I mean, I wouldn't, I don't know if I would ask this question, but I think I will. Do you have a preference? What brings you the greatest joy? What you're doing in the day or this fabulous, not really a hobby, because it is like a career as a writer and, and penning these incredible it's works. Right. It's, it's, it's the Jekyll and Hyde. It's the Mr. Right. Hyde's career. Both have their reasons and have their... <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, the answer is... Is Jim? I, I still love practicing law. I, I enjoyed the interaction with clients, with uh, with other advisors. Um, it's I enjoyed the some of the puzzle aspects of some of the things I do. I mean, there's some sometimes the planning is is a problem to be solved. It's you know you have to sort of figure out a solution. Some of it is simply helping families solve their own family issues about money yeah. or about uh, dysfunctional relationships. Yeah. So I really enjoy that very much. I mean, I, I wouldn't at this point, I don't see myself giving up either one of the two jobs. Yeah. Yeah. You love them equally, which is fantastic. What are some of the other things that give you great blessing and joy in your life, Les? Five wonderful children, six beautiful grandchildren, uh, a loving wife. Uh, I love to cook. Uh, um, what's, what's and, the less specialty? Oh, um, uh, pasta probably some form of pasta but uh uh, i'm not a very good cook i just love to cook (laughs) i like that distinction the uh the the materials the books and all we have your website up on the screen there too but they can also find every book yep and and amazon as well and all the usual links to amazon barnes and noble indie bound um whatever your preference is and uh hopefully you will find many of these at bookstores near you what would um, maybe one before we go one little nugget maybe about Sherlock Holmes, Frankenstein, Dracula specifically that you learned in just your study that maybe uh, would fascinate us that isn't something that we would be aware of or it would be on the tips of our tongue about each of them? Well, in the case of uh, Dracula, I've already told you a great one that I found. Yeah. So in the case of Frankenstein, I guess I would say that I too suffered from the wrong-headed idea that it was a book about a mad scientist and science gone wrong. Instead, I was really overwhelmed to learn the realities of Mary Shelley's life, uh, her relationship with Percy Shelley, her relationship with her father, the fact that she had lost her mother uh, in childbirth, basically. And um, and, and how autobiographical, I mean, that seems really crazy to say about Frankenstein, but how autobiographical the book was. Uh, that was the great revelation to me there. Sherlock Holmes, it wasn't anything, any single thing. It was really, Sherlock Holmes, the great discovery for me, frankly, has been the friendships that I've made over the last 30 years of immersing myself in the world of Sherlockians. Uh, Somebody wisely said it begins with a common interest in Sherlock Holmes, but it ends in these deep friendships. And if you are interested in Sherlock Holmes, 
almost every city in America, you'll find a Sherlock Holmes club of some sort where you can hang out with people who like to talk about Sherlock Holmes and how they love Benedict Cumberbatch or they hated Johnny Lee Miller or they love Basil Rathbone or hated Jeremy Brett, whatever. So it's just, it's a grand entry card to a world of wonderful people, good friends. Do you ever, was there ever interest as well because of this keen interest in these figures in others such as like the Boston Strangler and others in that? Yeah. I'm not, I, I don't really have the chops, I think, to be a true crime writer, but certainly the historical figures. I mean, I've done, I've done annotations of uh, Phantom of the Opera um, and some of the other books that are sort of crime related. I've been wanting to do a book about Jack the Ripper for a long time, but I, I, it's a different skill to write a nonfiction book as opposed to an annotated book. And so someday, perhaps. Someday. Uh, Stay so, tuned, as we say in the broadcast yes. biz. Stay tuned. Well, this was fascinating. This was really fantastic. And we appreciate all the time, Les. I hope the show... I, you really met whatever expectations you had and you enjoyed the time great. with me as I certainly have with you, Les. Thank you. It was really a pleasure. Uh, it's uh, first of all, anybody that's willing to listen to me talk is, is wonderful, but uh, <laughs> no, this is, I, I, I hope that people are as fascinated by some of these characters as I am and that they'll dip into these books and it'll, you know, as I often say, these are books that don't need less clinger to make them better. But if I can add to the enjoyment of the reader, uh, it's my pleasure to do that. And more to come, uh, more to come. You're still doing your thing for the benefit of all of us and uh, the enjoyment uh, as well. Congratulations on all of it. Uh, you've Thank got a, you. lot of, a lot of product out there for people to enjoy. And uh, we will keep the porch light on for you, Les. You're welcome back to the Gym Masters well, Show Series anytime. Thank you. And Spread the word about our show. It takes a village. <laughs> of course, I will. I'm, I will. I will spread it on my uh, Twitter feed and so on. And uh, no, I'd love to come back, Jim, and we'll talk about whatever turns out to be the next project. So that sounds terrific. You be well, my friend, and uh, thanks for joining us. And enjoy the rest of your day. Okay. Thank you. All right. Take care now. Take care now. Leslie S. Klinger or Les joining us here on the Gym Masters Show world's foremost expert on Sherlock Holmes, as well as H.P. Uh, Lovecraft we talked about, Dracula, Frankenstein, and much, much more. If this fascinated you guys and you missed any of it and you'd like to see it again, it's archived on our YouTube channel, which is Jim Masters TV. You can see this again, and you can see hundreds and hundreds of episodes of the Jim Masters Show Live Entertainment Lifestyle Variety Talk Show Series for your enjoyment. What a fascinating conversation. How you got a chance to learn a little bit more about these uh, legendary figures in life and uh, have it broken down by a, a gentleman who has spent many, many years being fascinated by it all and, and writing about it and uh, sharing it with all of us. And just to think, he has a full-time day job as well. I relate. <laughs> and But if you do what you love, love what you do, as we talk about a lot on the Gym Master Show Live, it all just comes, you know, uh, effortlessly. A lot of work, blood, sweat, and tears, but it comes, it, it just comes naturally uh, for a guy like Les and um, really fascinating. So again, you can go to his website. Everything is there for you on the website and we'll pull that up again. Leslie S. Klinger. Uh, dot com and also Amazon and all the other places where you can get uh, books. So you can check it all out. And we appreciate him joining us here on the show and uh, sharing in this great, great conversation. Like I say, we have entertainment, we have conversation, we have comedy, we have poignant moments. Our series uh, harkens back to the old school talk shows with a modern vibe and bringing it all back for, uh, for all of you. Thanks for joining us, everybody. A real pleasure. Thanks to uh, our lovely squad and all the uh, viewers who have been commenting. Uh, we appreciate all of that and all the lovely everybody watching with our international uh, audience. I think that's really cool. Kathleen's in New York City. Thank you, Jim and Leslie, for a great conversation. And thanks for being here. And Maureen in Arizona, very interesting conversation. I feel like I learned something about an unfamiliar topic. Perfect. 
so did I as, you know, the host of the show and producer. I'm always learning as well, which I think is really cool. And uh, Sherry in Kansas. Thank you, Jim. This was very interesting. Love these stories. Can't wait to get a hold of his books. And thank you for all the great guests. The pleasure is mine. Colleen Gaynor watching. Thank you very much, Colleen. And saying congratulations to Les on all the fabulous books and much more to come. You know, he, he's, he's having a real ball digging in deep and, and sharing it, which I think is fantastic. And um, Sherry also says here, thank you, uh, Leslie, for being here. What a wonderful career. The subject matter is fantastic. I can tell you really enjoy it. Uh, Jen Barry in Pennsylvania, USA says, today should be about love and peace. Spot on. We talk about that all the time at the Gym Masters Show live series. And uh, Joan says, thanks, Jim, for a lovely evening. You are very welcome, Joan, and everybody who's commented from around the world. If you would like to see this again, all of these episodes are archived, hundreds of them, for your pleasure here on uh, the Gym Masters uh, site, which is our YouTube channel, and that's Gym Masters TV. As a matter of fact, while you're there, give this episode a thumbs up, like, comment and subscribe. It really helps us and it helps that YouTube algorithm. <laughs> when you subscribe to our channel, when you leave a comment uh, underneath all the episodes and you click that thumbs up sign, uh, we love it. We appreciate it. And YouTube sees it and they share these episodes out even further around the world. Hit that red subscribe button. There's no cost for that. That is uh, free. And that helps us out right here at the Gym Masters Show series as well. So we thank you guys for being with us. Amazing guests coming up on our show. Uh, tomorrow we have coming in, it's another fascinating conversation, Maya Payne Smart, author, writer, educator, and mom. Uh, a literacy action plan from birth to six, reading for our lives. She's on a big mission as a mom to uh, help kids be literate, help them read and find it pleasurable. It's going to be a fascinating conversation. Much more to talk about. She's coming up. And then on Thursday, we've got a special episode Thursday afternoon. You know who's returning to the show? Burt Ward. Robin from Batman is coming back for a return engagement. He's got a lot of cool things he wants to talk about, about pet safety, about Halloween, how to keep your pets safe for the holidays coming up. Uh, the holiday season, and also we're going to talk about, because he's a big animal rights activist, we're going to, of course, talk about more about uh, Batman and Robin and his incredible career as Robin. He's coming back to the show with lots of new cool things this Thursday at a special time, early. It's 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific. All right, gang? So for those of you who want to be with us live when... Burt Ward, Robin from Batman, the legendary series, Batman, is going to be here. Join us 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific, this Thursday. It's an early show on Thursday. And you know who's going to be with us on Saturday? Another return guest and another favorite, Voices of Classic Soul. Yes, you may remember that famous birthday episode a year plus ago. When Joe Coleman and Joe Blunt and Theo Peoples joined us, the hilarity, the music, it was hilarious. It was a fantastic episode. And they've been involved with the platters, the four tops, the temptations. These guys are true legends. And they had formed a couple of years ago, Voices of Classic Soul. So they're going to be live with us on Saturday night, 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Pacific. It's going to be a cool, fun, musical uh, just a really terrific Saturday. This Saturday, live and exclusively, they are returning to the Gym Master Show Live series. They loved the last time they were here. They wanted to come back, and they're coming back this weekend, this Saturday. Joe, Joe, and Theo, they're going to be with us. They're absolute music legends, part of the newer group, Voices of Classic Soul. They are with us. Yes. If you didn't see uh, incredible actress Jenny Kwan with us, she, of course, starred on NBC's 
California Dreams. She was in My, Miss Saigon. She's been on The Nanny with Fran Drescher. She's been in Anger Management. She's in Around the Sun Season 2 now, presented by Brad Forenza. She was with us uh, last night. Maraid Nesbitt from Celtic Woman and uh, a whole host of other great things. Matter of fact, today is, uh, well, I think the 28th, her song is coming out, which we talked about, and uh, Man of the House and Grammy and Emmy nominated Celtic violinist. She was with us recently and, and so many others. Again, guests that come from all different backgrounds, all different uh, levels of celebrity, all different things they want to share and want to say. And every show is something different. We're not just about actors, not just about music, not just about comedy, not just about food, not just about classic Hollywood or new Hollywood or, or, just Broadway or sports, or we are about everything. This is an all around full circle 360 entertainment lifestyle variety talk show series with something for everybody. And um, I love that. That's what keeps it interesting for me as a host and executive producer is to have all these different guests and all these different topics and all these different viewers coming in. And we welcome everybody who is with us regularly. We are loveties and we also welcome new folks all the time. So if you're joining us for the first time here on the Jim Masters Show Live Series, we welcome you and we hope you'll stick around, enjoy us, uh, enjoy all these great episodes and enjoy us regularly and uh, share the levity, tell everybody you know about our series or I will turn into Frankenstein if you don't, or maybe I'll turn into Dracula. <laughs> we thank Les for joining us here on the show. He was amazing, wasn't he? Really cool topic. The world's foremost Sherlock Holmes, Dracula, and Frankenstein expert right here on the Jim Masters show. Really, really cool stuff. Uh, we thoroughly enjoyed it. And again, uh, don't forget to leave a comment, like, comment, and subscribe. We really appreciate all that. This is your host, Jim Masters, thanking you for your time this time till next time. And um, take a look at a few more comments and then we'll pop out. Got to have some dinner. Yes, good to know. If you want to know what's coming up on our uh, episodes, um, just look at our YouTube channel and look ahead and you can see upcoming episodes, great guests, and we hope you guys will be with us for all of them. Colleen, thanks for the great comments. Good to see you here. And, uh, yes, voices of classic soul are going to be here Saturday. Great guests coming up throughout. So, uh, you guys are amazing. And again, you know, what's really nice is so many guests want to return to our show. We've had guests who've been with us two, three, four times. And each time is something new and fresh and different. But the fact that they want to be back with us here on JMS, I think is so cool. And uh, that's just incredible. So good stuff. Good stuff. You guys are great. We're going to pop off here again uh, for all of us here at the Gym Master Show Live. We hope your day is going well. I hope you guys are in good spirits. You're in good shape. Breathe from the diaphragm. Yeah. If you ever get if things get a little crazed, and sometimes I have to remind myself to do that, take a breath. Life can be crazy. It can be unpredictable. Just breathe from the diaphragm, pause a little bit, just let yourself sort of recycle, get grounded again, and then tackle the rest of the day. We say that all the time with our inspirational commentary here on the Gym Master Show Live. Hope you're having a good day. And again, if you're not, you know where to turn. You can binge watch our past episodes. They'll make you feel good. You'll learn something. You'll be entertained. You'll have a laugh or two. Join us live when you can. Uh, if you can't, if you miss an episode, everything's archived for you on our YouTube channel, Gym Masters TV. So you can go and uh, you can have a binge party with friends and have a lot of laughs with some of the episodes that have occurred thus far on our series as we're approaching 900 episodes. Really, absolutely incredible. Gang, we don't say goodbye around here. We say see you later and ciao, moi loop, cheers, hasta la vista. We say sayonara. We say uh, slancha, be well, take care. And don't forget to be good to one another and take care of one another and be sure and be good to yourself. It's really important to be good to yourself and take care of yourself as well. Miss Pat in Texas says, thank you, Jim. I enjoyed the interview. Thank you very much, Miss Pat in Texas. Hope your day is going well. And have a wonderful night too. Kathleen says, sleep well. You too. You too. Smiles coming in from Colleen Gaynor. All right. Appreciate that. Smiles right back at you. Here on the Gym Masters Show, this is your host, Gym Masters. It's so easy to remember my name. Just say the name of the show, right? <laughs> uh, I forgot to be well. Take care. God bless. You got it all covered. Right back at you, Colleen. Take care 
and be well. And God bless to you as well. See you on the next episode. I'll be here. We're working behind the scenes to put together some of the best broadcasts we can for you uh, with a great content, content creation coming out here with a lot of thought and a lot of time and attention going into these shows. And we're so glad that you're enjoying them. Continue to share, continue to share the links, uh, the YouTube episode links on your social media. Let your friends know about our series. And thanks for stopping by. Really appreciate you guys being with us uh, from all around the world, morning, noon, and night, whatever time of day it is. The fact that you're here with all of us, we really, truly appreciate it. So for all of us here at JMS and in Lovety Hall, Jim Masters saying, take care, be well. And we'll see you here next time on the Jim Masters Show live. Be well. Cheers. <laughs>